The city of Berlin is known for housing some of the most prestigious music record, la record labels dedicated to electronic music in the world. But it is also home to the headquarters of one of the most unique record labels that exists on the planet, dedicated to unearthing the exotic sounds of the Middle East. It is called Habibi Funk, and here we have the founder and director of that record label, Mr. Janis Stutz. Nice to have you here with us. I know you came on a delayed flight. This is the thing about modern day traveling on low cost airlines. But it is an exciting time, isn't it? Uh, the world is very much connected. How does this help you to unearth, you know, your job, you know, of unearthing exotic sounds? Because you obviously travel quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, in order, without trying to kick it off uh, compli more complicated than it should be. But for example, exotic, I would never ever use. Just because exotic is so much a construct of a Western perspective upon mm. non-Western countries. Um, having said that, yeah, obviously it's uh, these days. I've like we have the privilege that that flying became comparatively cheap. Um, a lot of the work I do kind of depends on me being physically um, in the region, doing research, meeting artists, trying to find music. Um, but um, yeah, therefore, and then uh, in the end also communicating all of it through the internet. So therefore, I guess the way the label is operating is very much like a reflection of the travels and communication ways of that we have in, in modern times. So f for anyone who's not heard of any of the records that are edited or released or re-released or reissued by Habibi Funk, your label is uh, different to other labels. You're finding your, uh, as you say, you, I like how you clarified that it is wrong for us to call it exotic because that is our European perspective, shall we say, of music that has existed mm. for many years. Yeah. And I also read that you don't like the word discover. <laughs> yeah, that kind of goes into the same direction. I guess if, if you re-release music as a European label and your focus is music from non-European countries, it kind of automatically puts you in a historical, in a historical continuation of of colonial times, um, and therefore I guess it's necessary to be very aware of certain historic patterns that might be an issue for for that particular exchange um, of cultural goods. Um, and yeah, discovery is one of these things because when in, in, in the digging world, when you look for old records and you go on the flea market on a Sunday and you find a record that not many people know, that word of I discovered this record is a very u commonly used term. But at some point, a friend of mine pointed out that in that particular context, it's kind of like Christoph Columbus discovering South America. People already knew it was there. It was just for us as the Western perspective for the first time um, seen. So um, with records, it's the same thing. I, discovering kind of suggests it was not known by people, but most likely people in the region, people in the country, people in the city were very well aware of the music. Um, so yeah, uh, I think in, in, in general, that's always, or it always is important for us to be aware of, of um, certain issues that come out of the, the, the specific setup that we're in as a label dealing with non-European music. It's f it, you know, you mentioned colonialism. It's true that when the word comes out into a discussion, people get alert. But it's funny because a lot of the bands that, are, that you have uh, reissued on Habibi Funk were bands from countries like uh, um, Syria or Lebanon, which in turn discovered American funk or you know, m you know the the music that was maybe popular in the United States, and mm. then they made it their own by fusing it with mm. the more traditional sounds of of their lands. Yeah. So it's it's curious how sometimes. Th th yeah, I mean th th that is in the end. Uh, even though the the name Habibi Funk kind of suggests it's about funk music, it's it's not necessarily only that. Um, for example, on the last compilation, there is an Algerian track uh, of a w which is done by an Algerian singer who does Coladera music, which is like the traditional music of Guadeloupe. Um, so uh, the, the type of music that we're interested in in the label is where there was an exchange of influences coming from outside that were blended with local influences. And that might very well be 
forms of Western music of the time, be it like soul, funk, disco, uh, but it might as well be more than that and more obscure influences. Or there's, for example, one album I really, really love from Lebanon, which is heavily influenced by Brazilian music. Like the the, the musicians were listening to Antonio Carlos Rubin, like the the Brazilian composer, and kind of brought that together with their influences of. Uh, folk music and jazz and all of that. So this exchange is kind of what we are interested in. So that's interesting. So when, 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 help us understand because you deal with this dilemma on a daily basis. It's part of your, your work, I imagine. Uh, when, because everyone, now it's still a very current topic, the whole thing of cultural appropriation. Here we have some recent cases with the whole flamenco how there are new pop artists coming and they're taking the, a lot of the symbols or the traits from flamenco, like the hand claps, some of the words, the slang, the gypsy slang. And if they are not of gypsy blood, they get a little bit criticized by a lot of, uh, well, some public opinion. And it's an interesting debate. So in your opinion, in your, in, with your expertise, when, where, where's the fine line? Where's the division between cultural appropriation and honoring a culture that may not be your own. I, I, I would assume using the term gypsy is already a, a part of, of a problem starting point. But then again, I'm not part in this discussion, but I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I mean, everyone will answer this question differently. Um, and we answer the question in a way that we want to make sure that we are very well aware of what we are doing and the historic continuations that come out of it. So we want to make sure that the deals we're doing with artists are something that where I, feel where I would feel very sec self-secure about just posting them publicly because there's nothing in there that it feels like it's attackable, like we split profits 50-50. Um, all of the costs for traveling to the region, region, doing research comes out of my share of 50%. Um, we're trying to make sure that when we communicate visually that we don't fall into certain stereotypical patterns. So you'll never see a camel, a belly dancer or a pyramid on any of our covers because, again, it's a very stereotypical narrative. Um, we, at least for the more like key points we're making on social media, it's bilingual. Um, even like the back of the record sleeves always has the track listing in both languages. Um, and we do that despite the fact that I'm sure the majority of the people in the region that listen to our releases speak English very well, but I mean, for us, it's more like a symbolic thing to, to incorporate the language of the region as well. Um, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, uh, and what I, to come back to, 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 to my original statement, that for everyone, that question of cultural appropriation and where they draw the line is very different. Like, there's, there's very few people I've had discussions with that kind of reject m me doing the work I do just beca because I'm a European man, which is a position I can respect, but then I also realize there's no real basis for a discussion because there it's not about how can we improve what we're doing in order to, to, to be aware, very well aware of the potential issues, but it's, it's, it's being rejected in general and then, yeah. Um, but yeah, for us, I guess it's being aware of certain issues. What's well, also beautiful, you know, music brings us together. Uh, music is a celebration of life and all those cliches, you know, let's not get too softy. <laughs> love music, love. But um, how important is the role of a label like Habibi Funk in diminishing Islamophobia? which is so, you know, now that there's, you know, how social media is, we all see it, there's a rise in fascist uh, opinions and everyone gets to speak hatred. So, and, and especially the Islamic community suffers a lot of this because of the way the media is manipulated. And, you know, I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but in your, from your experience and from your view, I mean, how much good, how necessary is a, a record label like Habibi Funk in, you know, giving visi visi visibility to Islamic culture mm. and celebrating it it's, yeah, it's positive. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would differentiate. I think what we are doing at best is giving visibility to Arabic culture. I mean, none of the the music that we do is not religious. So Islam being the obviously the majority 
uh, religion of the region, but for example, the, the Egyptian release we did, he's, a, he's, a, he's an Egyptian Christian. So I think uh, our reference point would more be the Arab world as opposed to necessarily the Islamic world, even though there, there's obviously a very strong overlap. Um, but I mean, primarily what we're doing is not a political statement. I mean, the, 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 the thing that, that motivates me is re-releasing music I personally like and where I see a disparity between availability and the musical quality. Um, so bridging that gap is kind of what the main motivation and driving force behind the label is. The whole um, aspect that you were referring to, I guess, is more like a positive, but not necessarily focused on byproduct of all of this. Obviously, when the type of music we release kind of does not fall in line with very stereotypical conceptions of 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 culture in the Arab world and all of that, and even for like people in in the region, like people of like our generation when they hear Fadul, which was like a Moroccan artist we released, a lot of them can't believe it that there was an artist like this in the 1970s in Morocco. Um, but at the same time, I also don't want to make this bigger than it should be. Like it's only really like a tiny, tiny puzzle piece um, in, in trying to paint a different story, trying to portray different realities. Um, and um, I don't want to I'm sure it has a very certain relevance in what we do, but I also don't want to make it bigger than it is. We are, we're not, yeah, we're not, uh, if I would try to portray ourselves as cultural ambassadors, I guess that would be a bit out of, out of order, so yeah. And <coughs> for a more frivolous question, is, it, is the record, especially, you know, is the record business still a business? It, does it have a future? Yeah, I mean, for me it's, I, I run another record label called Jakarta Records, and we did like the first Anderson Pack record, first K Tranada, Muramasa, Taku. So a lot of people that came became kind of big afterwards. Um, and Habibi Funk is under the same company. Um, so having uh, having Jakarta in the se as the same like like as the mother label kind of helps economically and. Um, allows us to do certain things also when it comes to the type of deals we make to do the way we do it because the economic pressure is not there like it might be if did this would be the only revenue stream mm -hmm. but yeah I mean it's you know, you're not gonna get rich by it so I'm non I don't think I'll ever drive a Porsche but <laughs> uh, then again I don't really care for that so no but uh, I mean it's me and a friend I went to school with in the last five six years we've been doing it full-time uh, we have one colleague that comes in twice a week. We're about to hire another one. So yeah, well it's, it's in, in within that very, within its limitation, it's still a business, yeah. Well, the fact that you're here in Barcelona, it's not your first time. You've been here a few times to play. No, funny you? enough, I've never been to Barcelona. I, I've, I've played in Spain a couple of times. I played in Madrid and I played at uh, Uva Festival in Ronda. Uh -huh. Uh, but I've never played in Barcelona and I've never been to Barcelona. Okay, so I'm so actually staying until Sunday just to hopefully not to be too hungover tomorrow and get to see the city a bit. Well, what a great opportunity for us here at Primavera Club to be <laughs> able to enjoy. I also like how oh, we only talked about politics, but yeah, that's good. That's ah, good. Yeah. I mean, I guess you, you, you talk about the whole, whole music thing I for know, the rest of the night. So. <laughs> no, yeah. we're, trying to, we're trying to act serious now, like we're on CNN or something. Yeah. Radio yeah. Primavera Sound. Thank you so much, Yanis. It's you. been a pleasure to Thanks have you here with us. Me. Looking forward to your DJ set. Thank Round you. Round of applause for <laughs> Habibi <laughs> Funk. <laughs> Thank you.